You've done the work, you've put in the time, so why do you still feel like you don't belong? And how do you handle the sometimes overwhelming feeling of self-doubt? Yeah. Welcome to the Gig Boss Podcast, where musicians go to learn how to navigate the new music economy. My name is Adam Meckler, and it's my mission to get you the tools to have a thriving career in music. And we do that by talking about things you'll have to deal with today, like streaming and like social followings and like sync licensing and whether or not you should hire a publicist or if you should release an album or singles. We also do that by going straight to artists and we ask artists how they built their careers, how they became successful musicians in a weird and changing industry. There are always things that are replicable that you can take and apply to your careers and today we're talking about imposter syndrome imposter syndrome and self-doubt and my guest is the great trumpeter band leader composer and educator john raymond who has two wonderful bands kind folk and real feels they've toured all over the world played all kinds of music and i hope that my conversation with john will make you feel like you're not alone in this struggle and that even the pros that are doing it at the highest level are dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with and hey There's light at the end of the tunnel. So here's my conversation with John Raymond. John, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today, man. Yeah, man. It's been a little bit. I'm glad we can do this. Yeah, likewise. I want to talk about imposter syndrome as a central theme, but I'd love to talk a bit about like how you built your following first and maybe get some of your takes on how to navigate the music world right now. Does that sound all right? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, first, I spent some time poking around your social channels, listening to your music, uh, sort of prepping for talking with you. And if I had to describe your music with a word, I think I would use thoughtful. Uh, And I guess that's threefold. Your trumpet playing, your writing, and the presentation of the music. So when you're prepping for a new recording project, you've got a whole bunch of stuff coming out now with Kind Folk, your new band. Uh, What's your process like? That's a great question. Um, and that, I really appreciate that word. Um, if I were to give you like a word or two that I would love for the things I do to represent, that's probably one that would come up. Cause I, I feel like I, I want to be really intentional. Maybe it's another word, you know, yeah, yeah. it kind of goes along with that. Um, so, okay. So what did you ask? Uh, <laughs> So what's your process like? Like when you're getting a new pro- uh, a project started, a new recording project, um, I'm thinking about like, like, are you thinking about the the musicians you're writing for first? Are you thinking about the music? Are you thinking about the setting? Like your settings are always really cool and vibrant in your videos too. So like, what what's what's on your mind when you're when you're planning a new recording project? Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess for me. Um, I feel like I tend to take a while to conceive of the things that I, I'm trying to do because sometimes I would say most of the time it doesn't all come to me quickly or right away. Mm. It's like a, a very gradual process that just kind of unfolds slowly. Um, now that can be accelerated if I have a deadline, of course, yeah. um, then it has to unfold <laughs> at a certain rate. Um, but I guess all that being said, um, I guess in certain ways, I just try to visualize what I want out of the thing that I'm trying to do. So for example, um, I, I'm getting ready to release a new record in the spring, which is a, a collab with S. Carey. Oh, yeah. You know him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, drums with Boney Bear, is that right? And then he also has like his own kind of yep. solo project. Yeah, so, so Sean and I went to school together at Eau Claire and, uh, you know, started this thing like three years ago now where we started writing some music together and recording some stuff. And it's basically taken, it's going to be almost four years uh, by the wow. time it comes out before it'll actually get out and that's been one of those things where I could sort of like visualize something uh, like the sound or the feeling of the music very hazily at first Mm -hmm. and then as I started digging into it more it started to become more clear like oh okay this is what this is 
um, as we got other people involved, then those things come to life in new ways. Um, but that's a little different, I guess, than like, say the stuff that I've done with real feels because it's like a set group of guys. Uh, we've played together for a lot of years now. And so I know what to expect when I bring something to them, for example. Right. Uh, and actually right now I'm like working on writing a bunch of new music for that band too. And I'm, I'm, feel like I'm having a fresher realization or, or maybe visualization, I guess, of what I'm going for because I've played with them for so long. Yeah. You know? Um, so I guess, I guess it just depends on the thing. Um, videos, it would be the same way. Like I try to, to some extent, imagine like what something might look like. Um, and if I'm checking out a space, to record a video in or if I'm imagining like, you know, tr trying to figure out uh, who's going to do the video or who's going to do the audio. I just want to get as good of a sense as possible into like what it might be. And I know that in the end, everybody's improvising in some way, like we're all kind of making it up. And so it, it changes by the end of the process. But um, Usually I feel like with enough thought and enough intentionality for, for me, then it can at least be at like a quality that I feel good about. And yeah. so even if, even if it like looks different or it sounds different than what I initially imagine, I'm, I guess I'm trusting that the process of which I'm kind of going through or like the people that I asked to be a part of a, a certain project that I, I know that it's going to be really good. I just don't know exactly what it's going to be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Kind of trusting the people that you, you work with. I mean, that's a cool, totally, yeah. Yeah. And it maybe takes time to get to that place. You've been playing with real feels. How long has real feels been a band? Um, let's see. We started in like 2014, I think it was. Okay. So is that right? Yeah. 2014. So it's been, coming up on like eight or nine years um we've had a couple years off because of the pandemic here and being separated from each other but yeah um yeah hi history with people does a lot <laughs> you know it's like totally uh totally. that's a whole thing so with that band you've chosen some interesting covers and and uh i noticed you did like between the bars with with kind folk as well which is uh a, a tune that Jan, my wife's band covered years ago. A great, great, beautiful tune. Uh -huh. um, I was just talking with someone about how interesting covers can be a way uh, to generate listeners, um, and provided the song is is recognizable. And and you know you've got between the bars, you've got uh, you guys did the times they are changing, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Bon Iver tune, Ad, uh, Adams for Peace, the, the Tom York tune, like. All these tunes, you have maybe tens of thousands of views on these tunes on YouTube. The latter, I think, the Tom York tune has like a hundred thousand, almost a hundred thousand views on YouTube. Um, when you decide to do a cover, what sort of things are you looking for in a cover song? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, uh, pretty much all these songs have come about in the bands that they that I'm doing them in, not really thinking intentionally about like what what cover should I do? Yeah. Um, in fact, it, it's actually been like kind of surprising to me over the years. Like, Oh wow. A lot of people have checked out that song or a lot of people have checked out that video and it makes sense for all the reasons that you just said. Um, but I think maybe that's a clue for me into how I'm going about picking them because I, I know personally when I, am wanting to do something for like a reason that I feel like is a little bit superficial. Yeah. And when I'm, and I, I know the difference between that and when I'm really trying to do something because it's what I really want. And it's like a, it's a more heartfelt, deeper thing. Sure. And it, I find that actually for me, it takes, again, going back to what I said earlier, it takes like a longer amount of time for me to pick what kind of cover tunes I do because of that reason it takes it it's like what I've heard people say about a tattoo is like if you if you uh if you go like a year knowing that you want the same thing like tattooed on your body yeah. and 
you a year later you're you're still in the same place like yeah i want to do it then you should get a tattoo sure but you shouldn't be impulsive about it yeah (laughs) i feel like it's that way for me with a cover but maybe it's not quite the same uh length of time or something but like i i need it to like sit with me for a while sure and it needs to be something that kind of becomes an earworm Mm. and and like just kind of gets in my system um like a great example of this actually is there was this song that Chris Thompson, great saxophonist in the Twin Cities, who yeah. we both know, um, showed me years ago by John Hopkins called The Low Places. And I had never heard of John Hopkins at that point. And I checked out the song and I was like, whoa, this song is amazing. Like, there's not that much to it, but the progression and sort of the, the melody harmony that's happening in the song made it kind of addicting for me to just listen to mm-hmm. and then as I, I took that tune that we did together and I brought it to Real Feels and we started to do it and I still love doing that tune because it's got it's got something there that is really special you know cool um, so yeah I, don't know. <laughs> I feel like that you know a lot of the special sauce in there is finding the and this is something I think about a lot is like how can I find the intersection between the music that really feels, uh, that feels that I that, that 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 there's like a pure sincerity about my love for it, and also what people want to hear. You know, it's like I'm thinking about like I don't I don't know that I'm being I'm I'm going like I want to do this song just because a ton of people will right. hear it, but it's also like hey, this song is I mean even kids songs do like you know we've been watching Encanto a bunch at my house with the kids mm-hmm. and there's this great song uh surface pressure right um and I like I hear that song and I just like I hear a brass band playing it in my head you know I'm like mm-hmm. immediately taken to an, a, a place where it's like this would be an amazing cover and I know that if I could like jump on it I could probably capitalize on the popularity of it but also like I love that song and it's special to me because my kids and I sing it together you know what I mean mm-hmm. yeah uh, so it's like finding that it's like and, and maybe you stumbled on that accidentally with some of those I was gonna say actually the song of yours that like on Spotify you've got that Chris Morrissey tune has like 700,000 <laughs> and that's a cover yeah. that yeah. nobody would recognize right I mean by and large like that's not a cover that everyone recognized like the times they are changing and that's the one that really hit the most did that end up like on a on a playlist or something like how did that get to be man I owe Chris a lot of money <laughs> in all honesty <laughs> like uh it's it's funny like yeah we just started playing that song and recorded it live and it came out on our first live record and I don't even really know exactly how it has so many plays like I think it's been been put on a ton of playlists but it wasn't something that I even knew about I, playlists weren't even like a thing yeah. three years ago or whatever sure yeah <laughs> so, so or whenever that was so uh it, that's a that's a funny thing again where it's like this just felt like the right way to do the song yeah in in our ears and I, you know, and that's what I was going to say, going back to what you were saying about like this crossroads between the, or the, the intersection between the sincerity that you have of a song and then like what's going to catch. Yeah. And for me, I feel like almost always what's going to catch equals like it equals how to do the song right. Hmm. And it's not to say that there's one way. Right. But I think making great musical decisions with a song and knowing the kind of spin to put on it that will help it land in a different way, uh, that usually makes it catch to me. But that feels purely musical. Right. And I I, I can stay in that zone rather than get too, uh, I don't know, sidetracked, if you will, with like the, um, the game. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, you know. sure. And um, but it's a game. It's challenging. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely challenging. Yeah, that that game thing. I I always, I always, you know, I I wonder f- about artists and how they conceive of of music they make, um, especially artists like yourself. And you've got, you know, you're the director of jazz trumpet at Jacobs School of Music, so you've got this sort of like foundational gig. I've heard people. Uh, refer to the to the university gig as like the new record label deal right it's like mm. you get a re, you get a you get a university gig it's you have some kind of foundation do you feel that that 
allows you to to be that uh, sort of like staunchly pure as an artist, or do you like before you got that gig, you were you were you were just grinding it out, acting that same way. I you know it's like I've got a family, I've got kids and a wife. My wife doesn't work, so it's like I'm always thinking like, man, how can I also get some return mm-hmm. on these this music that I'm making, you know, in the hustle sort of way. Uh, but I always admire artists that it's like the only stuff on their pages is their beautiful music. Like, I go to your YouTube page and it's, man, it's mm. only songs of you guys playing your songs. You go to my YouTube page and it's like trumpet licks and trumpet whatever and here's beginning trumpet video and here's also a video of me with my orchestra and whatever. It's just like so... But, but that's a beautiful thing about what you do is is you are very diverse in the things that you have your hands in. And I'm probably similar in certain ways, right? Like with the podcast yeah. and with... Uh, this book that I did a couple years ago and like stuff like that. So it's, we, we all have our hand in a lot of things. Um, so to me, I would look at that and be like, man, this guy has like, he's, his reach is very wide, you know? Um, that's not, I don't think it's a negative thing at all, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I guess to answer your question, I do think that in some way, um, having the job that I have at Indiana university is, has allowed me to, um, be, well, I guess I'll say this. It's allowed me to be more picky and choosy about what I do and what I don't do. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm not spending as much time doing the kinds of things that I was doing when I lived in Brooklyn, but in, in the same way, um, I think when I lived in New York, it was still like, it was the same amount of sincerity was probably going into the things that I wanted to do. But, uh, now I feel like I'm solely focused on the things that feel very sincere to me. Yeah. Um, whereas before it was like, that was one of the many things that I was doing. Right. Right. Um, so I, I think in some ways, the, it it's changed it. Um, I think maybe what's changed even more for me is just becoming more comfortable in my own skin, if you will. Mm. Um, there's been something really good for me about moving back to the Midwest. Although people would say that Indiana is a Midwest, and I, it's like practically the South down it's the here. The South, man. yeah. <laughs> it's, man. <laughs> it's it's like. I'm like, man, this is not the Midwest. Yep, this yep. is this is different. That's a whole other conversation. My brother lives in Western Illinois, and he's already got a little bit of a, a Southern accent. Man, it's like crazy. Whoa, Western I know. Illinois. I know, man. Yeah, like we're not very far from Nashville and Cincinnati and yep. Kentucky. You know, Kentucky's right around the border. Right, so it's like, right. Anyways, uh, but I will say that being in the Midwest relatively has made me realize that this is kind of who I am and mm. uh there, there's something about that that I think has worked its way in and through me musically and artistically too where I feel just more confident and more comfortable in doing what I want to do and not feeling this pressure of trying to do something that uh you know plays the game a certain way to go back to what we were saying sure or, um to be a certain kind of artist, uh, which I maybe felt a little bit while I was in New York. And that's, that's not really anything against New York. It's probably more speaking to my immaturity and, and just like becoming more mature and more comfortable in my own skin and, and, um, and just okay with doing what I want to do and letting that speak for itself, you know? Right. That's awesome. So you mentioned your book, the jazz trumpet routine. Um, I'm curious like when you made that book and started to sell it, did you, did you use your social presence in, in a way that helped you sell? Like what maybe, what was the most valuable tool for you when you were selling that book? Was it an email list? Man, this is kind of mysterious to me too. <laughs> Honestly. Um, I have sold more copies of the book than I thought I would. Um, it's awesome. And I don't know exactly why <laughs> um, well it's great that's why I, I mean I got it on my stand man yeah like I I uh, I definitely especially around that time was posting things on my 
Instagram page or or on you know on Facebook too um, of just like samples of the exercises or this and that and the other uh, and I think that was actually also the first time that I really started experimenting with using hashtags on Instagram I'm sure that had a little something to do with it just attracting more people to that but honestly it it, it just felt like uh, it felt very organic to me hmm. and I still to this day don't know exactly how it's sold I've sold so many copies I'm not it's not like I've sold like thousands of them it's not really that many but um, more than I thought yeah. and um, I think I'm sure a part of it has to do with the fact that I teach at IU I'm sure part of it has to do with the things I've done up to this point, musically, artistically, um, and then just putting things on, on social media. But, but even then, like I remember after the book came out, that would have been fall of 2020. Um, I got really burnt out on posting all this stuff on social media. And I was, I was basically like, I'm I'm just going to stop. I I can't do it right now. And I had had thoughts and I still have thoughts about, doing sort of a YouTube series with the book that's more video based. Um, and I still have aspirations to do that, but it's, uh, finding the time amidst family life and amidst teaching and amidst giving the time to the things that I really feel like I want to give time to Mm -hmm. that has kind of gotten squeezed out. Um, so I don't know. Maybe some point down the road, that's going to happen again. I'm not sure. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I know a lot of uh, people that make their living on YouTube. It's not as much about ad revenue as it is about selling things that like PDF books or, hmm. or merch, T-shirts, you know, that kind of thing. It's like the, the majority of the people that are really successful doing that are selling things apart from that like the ads are a small percentage of, of revenue on the biggest channels interesting okay um, which is it, that was very interesting to me as well I've been, I've been talking a lot with Lu, Lu Sarmiento about this because she's really savvy with all this stuff and um, she's crushing it too and has a PDF book coming out just like a major scales exercise thing that she's going to sell um, but yeah it's like I feel like a series like that would, would do really well on YouTube especially since you have it, it seems like you have a pretty like people find your stuff whether or not like you, you, you went over to, uh, you created a, another page, a kind folk page uh, on YouTube rather than posting the kind folk stuff under your name where you have a few thousand subscribers. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm sh- just from outside looking in, I felt like, man, I might I probably would have posted that on my page so that I can reach my followers. But it's like you're, those videos are still, people are still finding them, mm-hmm. um, which is cool. And, and you know, on your, your stuff doesn't have, you don't run ads on your videos, right? On your channel. You don't like monetize. Uh, no, but after seeing the stuff on this podcast, I'm like, <laughs> man, I got to get on it. Well, I think you could, man. And I, you know, I mean, whatever. I'm not here to tell you what to do in any way, you know. Hey, man. And I'll never I'm all say, up for some feedback. <laughs> I'll never say you should, you know. Actually, um, it's funny, man. After I saw something that you did on here, I was like, I, I have it on my to-do list as something that I need to take care of this summer. Like, I need to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, there's so much, man. I'm learning you know. so much on this podcast. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, the, the the ad revenue thing is, you know, you've got videos at, at 100,000 views. It's like those, you know, at the very least you'd make, you know, if, they, if they're continuing to, if they're continuing to roll, you could, you know, you can make $30, $40 a month right. on videos like that. And, uh, and that's not nothing, you know, and, and for artists and for any artist, especially artists that are independent that maybe don't have other jobs you know getting that extra if you can get your spotify and youtube numbers to to be some kind of four or five six hundred dollars a month where you can pay your rent you can pay your mortgage maybe it's like that's game changer kind of numbers and i i never totally. saw that like i always i up until recently i was very anti streaming you know and I, like i would put some of my stuff up there but um that whole realm was it just felt like it was better for me to to try and go at it another way and and of course there are other ways but you know i released this album in june and like you know it's a digital only album and i'm not really trying to push people to bandcamp anymore i haven't had a ton of success with bandcamp 
Uh, but I've sold out shows and I've sold huge runs of CDs in the past mm. when people were still buying CDs as much. Um, and, you know, nobody heard really like, I mean, I'm not going to say nobody heard the record, but like maybe 50, 60 people heard the record until it was picked up by a Spotify playlist. You know, but when it, mm. when it got on an editorial playlist and it was like all of a sudden thousands of people have heard it and now thousands of people are paying attention to my music on Spotify. And it, it was this light bulb like, geez. So there's this whole other thing I can do to, to get my music heard and maybe get some revenue from all this yeah. work and time that I put, you know, it's like, it feels like, you know, we do tours and we sell merch on tours, but like, I'm not doing a month long tour with my quintet, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if I did that, maybe I could sell 500 units or something, but it's mm-hmm. like, I'm not doing that. So then it's like, how do you... It's this interesting conundrum, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it's, you know, we all have to be savvy with this stuff. Oh. Um, there, I don't think there's any ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, it's, it has to be a thing that's in the, um, the tool belt of every musician now. Mm. Um, and only if you're in the 1% do you have to can you not care? You right. Know? And exactly. you can let other, but even then you're going to have other people take care of it because somebody's going to be taking care of it. Yeah. So, um, you know, kudos to you for <laughs> figuring that stuff well. out. Cause I, I'm going to, I'm going to learn a lot from your podcast and, and like get my stuff together. So yeah, I'm just learning too. It just feels like I'm in a place of learning big time. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to level up, you know? Um, I'm curious about what you tell, your students today about, you know, it's like you've got students that are coming there to major in jazz trumpet. I majored in jazz trumpet. Um, it feels, uh, it feels maybe like the university didn't prepare me for a real life in music, you know, like they prepare me musically in some ways, maybe not in all the ways that they could prepare me. It's like, I probably should have learned like, uh, you know, 40 funk horn lines in addition to all the tunes, in, in addition to 40 tunes a week, you know, or the tune a week book that we did at Lawrence. Um, what are you, what are you telling your jazz students when they're majoring in jazz music? Like how, what are you telling them on how they can make a career in music right now? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, I think one of the things that's been on my mind a lot has been First, I want to try as much as I can to instill this and and not even instill, but help students keep the sense of wonder and joy and love for music that they had coming into school. Mm. Because I think one of the big things now, as we all know, is the, this whole um, stigma about music school. And how it can like crush you and wreck you and and take you out of music, and yep. that's a real thing in some ways. Uh, but I think first and foremost, it's I want to be a facilitator of that because um, I look at my own path, and while it's not going to be like everybody's, I look back on when I was in college and I think about how naive I was and even as I moved to New York I think about how naive I was about sure. what the scene was and and frankly even as we're talking now it's it's exposing like how naive I've been even as I've made the things that I've made because I'm just like I, I just want to do this that's like that's what I want to do and I'm learning later about like the the more business aspects of it or whatever. Right. And, but I I find that if I, when I ask myself if I would have, like, could I change or would I have changed anything about how I, what I knew, would I have changed anything about what I knew in college to like change the result uh, of my career or something, change the trajectory. And I don't think I would have because I Mm. think that naivete was a was one of my strongest things that I had because then I I just kept chasing this thing that I was really in love with. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know? yeah. And 
I think that's something that's been on my mind a lot teaching at IU is, is like, not that I want students to be naive, but I want them to have that sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. And when, when they're ready to talk about the, the brass tacks of stuff, then let's get into it. And actually what's been cool to, to, to have as a vehicle for that is I've also encouraged a lot of my students to just be writing music, putting bands together and recording their own music. Yeah. Like just get, get started with that process. Yeah. And that in and of itself puts all of the stuff that we're talking about into play. Mm-hmm. Right. Because then you, you start asking what, well, what does a record label do? Or like, how do I figure out streaming or digital distribution? Or yep. what about YouTube and et cetera, et cetera. None of that is even on the radar unless you have something that you're making that you are trying to share. Right. So I, totally. I feel like to me, it starts there. And once people, students can get that as sort of a, a routine in their life, like a habit that they just are creating music and they're sharing it with people. Then you start to get into these conversations about how to deal with money, how to deal with copyright, how to deal with licensing, how right. to deal with playlists, how to all this stuff. But it all starts from the love of the music. And then it starts for, and then from there, once you know that you love the music and you love what you do, then you're just making it. And then it happens, you know? Yeah. Cool. I don't know. It's great. But there's a lot of stuff. And, you know, we even, uh, over the past couple of years have revamped our curriculum in the jazz studies department. And now we have this, this like portfolio capstone, po- capstone portfolio class that I teach that is basically, you know, as a part of the class, you're, you're getting together a bio, your resume, your CV, your website, mm-hmm. a YouTube channel, a LinkedIn page, yep, yep. Um, getting your social media stuff together. And I feel like it's only been in existence now for a year or two. And already I've seen in students them come back to me like, right after they graduate, I just had somebody this summer. It was like, yeah, I just applied for this job and I'm really glad I, you made us do all that stuff in that class because all my stuff was ready. Right. You know? Um, and, and that's really like, that's an aspect of entrepreneurship that these students are learning. And anybody that goes into music as a profession is going to have to think like an entrepreneur at some point. Um, mm-hmm. you know, e- even somebody and, who has a job, a job like I do, it's like, I'm still thinking about, the way I, you know, your book, for instance, it's like, that's, that's an entrepreneurial endeavor. It's like, that's you mm-hmm. making a book, selling it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's also helps with tenure and things like that. But yeah, the students have to come out and, and I'm and always you know, surprised that they, they don't have to take classes in entrepreneurship or learn about those sorts of things, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also wonder, and I haven't thought about this until now, so I'm kind of um, thinking out loud here, but I also wonder if part of the reason we didn't get that as much when we were in school was because the people who were our teachers didn't have to do any of that. Yep. Right. It was a totally different industry. And now I think just the fact that you and I are in academia, um, and even having more and more people come into academia that are our generation or around our generation. Yep. Um, you're naturally going to have more students be feel comfortable to ask questions, but also see you as a model and know that, Oh, Adam's doing all this stuff. You know, he's making it happen. That's entrepreneurship. That's understanding the business and whether or not you're even talking about it in a class or not, just having you where you are or me, where I am or any other teacher that's like doing the thing, setting the example setting the example yeah. right i feel like that maybe in and of itself is what's going to start changing things in music schools because students know what their teachers are up to yeah you know, I, I know i did like I, I was obsessed with my teachers at eau claire and knowing what they were up to yeah so totally i talked I to know. chris johnson on the podcast and he mentioned something similar when he was out oh man Wyoming. He was the director of jazz studies there for a little Utah. while. Utah. Utah. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he talked about being up late at late nights. You know, the students would be 
texting him, go, I see your light on in your room. Can I come watch you work? You know, it's like, it's like seeing him work was a part of their motivation behind doing it themselves, you know? And he right. said it completely changed the culture, just him being there working his tail off every day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's cool. So I want to get a little bit into, um, imposter syndrome. You mentioned like being comfortable in your own skin, uh, you know, coming, moving back to the Midwest, quote unquote, uh, I just want to recap. You're totally crushing it as an artist, uh, as a trumpeter, professor of jazz trumpet at Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. Uh, you've got glowing reviews from Downbeat Magazine, New York Times, and others. You have a broad listenership on YouTube, streaming. You've got a great podcast, The Trumpet Summit. That's I don't know if you knew this, but Listener Notes places your podcast in the top 3% of all podcasts globally, which is wow. super rad. You um, know more things than I do, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a site called listennotes.com. It's pretty cool. They, they, they kind of like they rate different podcasts based on listenership, engagement, all that mm. stuff. Um, tell me a bit about your experience dealing with imposter syndrome uh, or, you know, we could even boil it down to maybe self-doubt, which is a little different than imposter syndrome. Uh, you really, you really recently sat on a panel about this, yeah? Yeah. So as I was saying, I'm... Uh the chair of this health and wellness committee at the Jacobs school. And we did this town hall back in January with five professors. Um, I, I was sitting on stage in this panel, uh, talking about imposter syndrome and perfectionism were sort of the two topics and just in awe of who I was sitting next to and hearing them share stories about the same kinds of things. It was, it was honestly like, very powerful Mm -hmm. and 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 kind of profound to hear these world-renowned artists uh dancers musicians saying the things that they're saying because on the surface uh you know even as you're spouting off all that stuff about what i've done um it may look to some people that it's like very i'm very accomplished or so-and-so that you really look up to is very accomplished and has it all together. Right. And I think the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I would probably wager that most people, uh, you know, in those positions, they have wrestled with self-doubt or imposter syndrome or whatever it might be um, to a point that it can be almost debilitating. Yep. And... Uh, I know like that was to some extent my experience and I wouldn't have even labeled what I've experienced in my life back then. I wouldn't have labeled as a, as imposter syndrome, but Mm -hmm. as I've more, I've read about things online, the more I'm like, Oh, maybe that's what this is or something. Sure. Sure. So is that related to like when you got your gig at, at Jacobs? Like I know for me, Got, I got this gig as the director of jazz studies at Michigan Tech, and it felt like, am I, am I big bandy enough for this? Do I, do I, you know, I love all these other styles of music. Is that okay? Like it was very like, uh, do I belong here? Do I really belong in this set? I don't have a doctorate, you know. Um, I had a lot of those thoughts coming in, and especially, you know, there's also the fact that like we're white dudes studying black music and playing black music, and I think there's a a place for being like, Hey, what's my, what's really my place in all of this? Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a healthy conversation, but you know, I, I dealt with some of those, some of those things myself, um, coming into this position and, and certainly in other scenarios as well. Uh, but was it, was Jacobs a catalyst for that kind of, you know, um, uh, not really. Um, I think in some ways, when I started teaching at IU, some of that imposter syndrome went away, huh. actually. Um, it was a little bit of the reverse because I, I felt like maybe for the first time I felt uh, validated or something. Yeah, um, interesting. Uh, that, you know, that I was... I And all things being said, I, I still look at myself in relation to the various faculty members here at IU and I'm kind of like, man, (laughs) the stuff these folks have done, like trumps what I've done by miles. Well, that brings up a good point is like comparing yourself to others is not a healthy thing just in general, right? Like bingo. 
Yeah. And that's going to be one of the reasons why you feel that way if you're constantly looking at someone else and going like, <gasps> I sh- I, yeah. should I be doing that? What? You know, I haven't done yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, I didn't really ex- start to experience this stuff until I moved to New York. Mm. Um, so I'm from Minneapolis. For those who don't know, I went to University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire for my undergrad degree. Very small school, hour and a half east of the Twin Cities. And generally was like a bigger fish in a smaller pond yeah. um, for five years when I was there. And again, just very naive in like what I knew about music and what I knew about the industry. I, but I was just like in the shed for the entire five years. Yeah, totally. And writing music and practicing and all that. And then when I moved to New York and I started to become regularly around my heroes as my peers and be around all these other incredible musicians I started to look at them and kind of think like okay if they're the real deal that I'm seeing as the real deal I am not that at all (laughs) Uh, I don't even like I pale in comparison to to the kind of people they are and the kind of things that they've done or the things that they're doing And I think part of that was true in the sense that like I had a lot to learn and I had a lot to grow in as a musician, as a person, as an artist, composer, whatever. But I think without realizing it, I kind of like turned that upside down and thought that I had to get good enough so that I could belong and become one of them. Yeah. And so basically my, my, uh, you know, outworking of my, what I'm going to call imposter syndrome at that point was just that I'm going to work my butt off and get as good as I can. But I, looking back on it, I know that all of that was very, very fragile because whenever I'd be in a situation and not perform like perfectly enough or, or to an extent that I sort of expected myself to perform. Yep emotionally and mentally I was crushed and I had many times where I would come home from gigs and the whole subway ride home I'm just like in my own head just like what just happened can I do this uh I I don't feel like I belong I don't I'm not I I can't do this And, and and it was even to the point where like you know the same kinds of uh disappointments or failures or whatever they would happen more than once sometimes like you know a bunch of times within the span of a year or two and i'm looking at that and being like okay if i was really the real deal shouldn't i have gotten this together by now you know sure sure i I basically just started to like just get really discouraged get very hypercritical dog myself of everything and of course there's no chance at being like creative when you can do any of that right. because all you're thinking about is just like being good enough whatever that means you know yeah and so it was really paralyzing for me and um you know it, looking back on it as you said it was so much um there was a lot of perfectionism involved in that so like for me it's it's been a big learning curve over the years of to learn like what is perfect is is perfect even a thing should i even be striving for that right you know or or is there something else that i should be going for um honesty for example like or just like whatever you know something else that's not this uh, this bar of perfection that's really impossible yeah um but there's a a large part of it that was comparison based Uh, you know comparing myself to these other people that i was around um, and I think in the end, what I've realized over the years is these kinds of feelings without realizing it, they were very like me centered. Mm-hmm. They were very ego centered. Um, I wanted to be good enough. I, it was all about how I felt and my perception of how I felt. Right. And I think that comes from this whole other thing where you, you are we all find our identity in certain things and looking back on it now i was real i've realized that 
when I struggle with this stuff, it's because I'm wanting to find my identity in what I do mm-hmm. or how I perform rather than having my identity being something totally separate from that. That's not based in performance. It's not based in um, the job that I have. Yeah. It's much deeper. You've ra- it's like you've wrapped your self-worth in how you perform rather than having your self-worth being in something exactly. external to that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's so personal. I mean, it's hard, man. Music making, especially when you're really striving to be an artist, like, and you believe in, in that, it's hard to not take those things, those experiences personally. I, I was going to mention comedians talk about bombing so so often and how important it is for them to bomb. And they almost, now they look back at it now and they... And they love they love that about you know I was just listening to an interview with Jimmy Fallon and he was talking about bombing, and he was just like man every bomb it's like you you get so much better from those experiences and it's in the moment it's like you can't you can't see that you can't see that big picture all you see is like oh my gosh am I good enough I don't think I can do this I don't think I can make it and meanwhile it's like the older comedians are sitting there going like yeah. <laughs> this is this is how you get you got to get through this part and then it's you know what I mean it's yeah. like this is part yeah. of the this is part of the the road you know well even like uh you know the other night the first episode of that Derek Jeter documentary came out uh-huh. on ESPN and I I'm haven't seen a sucker yet. for all of these <laughs> sports docs yeah I mean Last Dance like got me yeah, through man. the pandemic love that so good but you know I watched it and even he is talking about like. His first year or two in the majors, like completely sucking, like, you know, demoted to like whatever triple A or whatever he was doing and like, you know, just bombing to your to your point. And I think that's that's another really challenging thing facing younger musicians today that I think about a lot as a teacher. I'm sure you do, too, Mm -hmm. is like how how can I help students be okay with failure? Because if you can actually embrace failing and embrace bombing, Mm -hmm. not like you welcome it necessarily, but you know, that you're not going to go down that road of, of discouraging yourself and dogging yourself for, you know, messing something up. Yeah. But just knowing that that is what everybody has done from the beginning of time. Yeah. um, And there's more information. If you can do that, like you're going to be so much better off. Totally. Totally. I was going to say there's more, there's like more information in failing. There's more substance. There's more like, okay, um, you know, from a trumpet playing standpoint, it could be like, I have this 90 minute show that we're playing and... I could not, I did not make it. Like I did not physically make it through the show. All right, what are the things that I need to do to be able to physically make it through the show, right? There's information in failure. There's like, okay, I guess I need to do X, Y, Z now so I can get to this place where, I mean, the first time I toured with Youngblood was like, they're asking me to like, you know, ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta on double Gs. And I had never been able to do that before. And I was like, okay, I guess I have this touring gig now with this amazing band. I got to figure this out. It's like, how do I... And it's like, there's a lot of failure involved in figuring that out. And a lot of it was done in the trenches, you know, um, playing gigs with other bands and just experimenting. But man. And I think oftentimes, you know, we get really discouraged in, in those failure moments because we all have such high expectations for ourselves. We take what we do really seriously to your point earlier. Yeah. Like we love what we do. Mm-hmm. We, we hold ourselves to the highest standard. And I think that's also been an important realization for me is knowing that about myself, you know, uh, knowing that I'm a very intense person and I am very um, hard on myself can help me then when I have those moments, because if I'm really unhappy with it now, years later, I feel like I can channel that discontentment to something positive and i think that's that's the trick is like we're all going to experience these failures or bombs and so when they happen not if because 
they're going to happen. So when they happen, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to let it get to your ego and really damage your identity and self-worth? Or are you going to, you know, take take your medicine where you need to take it mm-hmm. and actually f- use that as fuel to get back in the practice room or get working on these things or figure out how to tongue double G's endlessly or yeah. whatever it might be, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. So what, what would you tell... Uh, you know, if there's a young person dealing with this phenomenon, uh, how would you suggest somebody combats these feelings? I mean, you, you mentioned like just taking the information and going to the shed maybe. Well, how do you keep your ego out of it and your personal feelings out of it? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. I guess one is, um, you have to ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I would say for most people, what you have to reckon with at a certain point is that you, you're doing what you're doing for approval from someone, Mm -hmm. um, or for validation from someone. And oftentimes failure can get us so bad because we feel that we've let that person or that group of people down or maybe that person is yourself sure like you need to validate yourself and so if you fail you feel like you've blown it right um and so you have to i think ask yourself like why do i do this and um it's not it's not a crime to say that you you want other people to experience something beautiful or positive from your music or from your art. Right. But if that's in the driver's seat, then I think there can be issues, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it needs to come from outside of that. And so that's one thing I would say. Um, that That's a question that anybody could ask themselves because I think we're all at different points on that spectrum. Or, totally or path or something. Um, I think it's really important to find other people around you that you trust and that you can be vulnerable with. Hmm. Because I think one of the things that I experienced and I think probably a lot of people experience is when you, when you fail, you, you kind of isolate and you retreat and you, you get really inward. Right. And I, I think that can be, da- not dangerous isn't the right word, but it, it doesn't help you. <laughs> I, I think, you know, for me, I think about a lot of those moments when they were happening for me in my, I want to say my formative years in New York, I would come home and I would tell Danny, my wife, about it, and she would kind of set me straight. <laughs> and yep. looking back on it, I if I hadn't had her... I think stuff could have been way worse than it was because I knew that I could come to her and just be vulnerable and be honest and tell her how I feel and cry in front of her mm-hmm. or be depressed or be down in front of her. Yep. Um, not have to put on any mask or any kind of like front and just be totally real with her. Right. And her encouragement and guidance and just frankly her outside perspective like i said it set me straight and i think in the same way having friends around you or people in your life that you feel like can be you can be that vulnerable with yeah helps you in those moments and you can just go to them and get their vantage point you know outside vantage point on your situation and be able to tell you honestly like hey um, it sounds like you could have done this better. And so how, how can you work on this? And also like you're beating yourself up because you're really hard on yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you're, you're, I value you and, and you're, you're more than these defeats or these, uh, these failures. You're, you're way bigger than that. Yeah. Um, I think community in that sense is, is really crucial. Um, so I don't know. Those those would be like a couple of things. I'm sure there is a lot more. Yeah, but. that was great. I mean, I feel like I feel like I'm still experiencing this a little bit um, from time to time. You know, 
I'll get asked to do some high profile thing and I'll be prepping for it. And it's like when I think when you be when you get to a certain level and you know what kind of preparation it takes to be really ready to be on your game to so that you're going to rehearsal and you're and you're not really rehearsing. It's like you know the music already, you know what I mean? These kind of situations. I just did a weekend of shows with Steve Cole, great smooth jazz sax player, and it was like Paul Peterson and Ricky P who tours with Fleetwood Mac and like Kirk Johnson who was in Prince's band for a long time. And so going into it, I kept going like, oh, 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 you know, like, am I, am I prepared enough? Am I ready enough? It's like, I'm, I've been shedding everything, but I don't have every, I don't have it all memorized, you know? And I showed up and it was like the friendliest, most wonderful atmosphere. It was like the easiest couple of gigs. It was, it was, it was just this great experience and it was a reminder to me that like like okay you've made it to this certain point now it's like you know how to prepare you can feel comfortable that when you've done the preparation that everything's going to be fine you know what i mean it's like a yeah. still and still and you hit this. The, you're hitting the nail on the head with another thing that i think is huge with this is that oftentimes with quote um, imposter syndrome what we experience is this sensation of feeling like a fraud mm-hmm. right like somebody's gonna find out that like we really weren't cut out for this thing that we're doing and we can't hack it, you know? Yeah. And I think another huge thing for me that I've had to very consciously learn over the years and even consciously tell myself is like, I belong here. Like I wouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing or in this moment on stage or in this moment teaching this you know, masterclass or whatever it would be. I'm not doing any of these things by chance because somebody thought I wasn't good enough for it. Right. Like I, I have done something (laughs) to have earned that. And totally, I think that's a really important thing to remember because whether it be like, you know, you're going to be a freshman in college and you're stepping foot uh, like in a conservatory and you hear everybody around you and you feel like I don't belong here. Or you're like on stage with these like badasses and you're like, I don't belong here. Or you're mm-hmm. playing this headlining this major festival somewhere. You know, it, it happens at all levels. Right. And at the end of the day, the answer is the same. And, it, and that is that you belong there like you're supposed to be there doing that thing and so you can take comfort in knowing that okay i i'm meant to be here right now Mm -hmm. now i just gotta figure it out and 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 that's where you learn uh as i'm sure like you did on the gig and as we all do in any of the situations we're in we learn from these experiences and all of it makes us better in the long run yeah you know yeah it's awesome it's great, man. I think that's a good place to leave off. I, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to hang and talk, man. This has been great. Yeah, it's great, man. So, this what what's going on with you moving forward? Like, what should people keep their eyes out for with the music you're releasing right now? Yeah. Um, well, as you mentioned, uh, there's this band called Kind Folk, which is a it's actually a collective band of New York based musicians and me. <laughs> um, we all met in New York and we played together for a long time. We just came out with a record a few months ago called Head Towards the Center. So that's out now and have been doing a bunch of touring this summer with that, which has been fun. And um, Man, that tune, but what is that tune? Power, Powerfall? Is that what it's called? Powerfall, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Dude, yeah. you got me with that tune, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one, man. We have a good time with that. That's awesome. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, in the spring, I'm going to be releasing a new record with um with s carry and um i'm really really excited about that one uh, just kind of working out details in terms of how it's going to be released and any touring with that but the band for that was really incredible it was sean and i and then um, aaron parks on piano and chris morrissey wow. on bass Woo. and dave divine on guitar and then nice. ben lester and jeremy betcher and all of our you know midwest homies upper midwest homies are on that too and um so i'm really excited about that that'll come out in the spring and uh starting to write some new music for real feels that'll see the light of day at some point soon too so awesome man see what what happens we're gonna link all your stuff in the show notes 
social handles, website, and we'll link some of the stuff from the new Kind Folk album as well, but you can find places to follow John and keep up on everything he's doing. Thanks again, man. You're the man. Thanks, dude. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with John Raymond. If you're interested in learning more, please join the Facebook group, Gig Boss Podcast. The link is in our description. You can download our app, the Gig Boss app, which is an organizational tool for musicians. Our goal is to become the number one DIY self-management platform. Gig Boss is for everybody. If you're a freelancer, if you're a band leader, it's totally free on iOS and Android. Manage your finances, manage your schedule. There's lots more features coming. And the other thing is that if you're interested in taking classes on how to navigate TikTok as a musician, how to do ads on Instagram and Facebook, and how to get into the sync licensing space i've got an episode coming up with graham barton who wrote the book tracks that sync and if you're interested in sync licensing there are courses for those things offered through ari's take academy and if you use the code gig boss g-i-g-b-o-s-s at checkout you'll get 10 percent off of any course that you take through ari's take academy that's ari herstan he was on the show a couple of weeks ago so go back and check out that episode if you want to know more about ari and what he does at ari's take academy we've got to deal with them enter the code Gig Boss, G-I-G-B-O-S-S to get 10% off any of his courses. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next week.